years ago. I'm going to tell you about this book, which I think is pretty interesting. Uh, and here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do it in three basic parts as to how the sense where I'm going. First, I'm going to tell you the basics of what West Way was about. Uh, from talking to some of you, I think some of you know quite a bit about West Way, but I assume some of you don't. Uh, and you will see you know, why it was such a high stakes battle, why it's used one of the epic environmental law battles, and also one that very much influenced the shape of New York City. Um, in some respects, it's kind of the keystone pipeline of its day. Uh, maybe a little hint of people at the oil spill, but, uh, but especially in New York City where urban priorities, urban development are huge issues, Westway was really just one of the uh, most uh, significant battles shaping modern New York. Then I'm going to step back for a bit and tell you just why I chose to write this book. One of the pleasures of being a professor is I get to choose what I'm interested in and write obscure things. Uh, and why I thought this is an interesting project. And then I'm going to, third part, the heart of my remarks, I'm going to kind of sketch out some of the key parts of the Westway battles so you know what went on. Um, uh, I see, by the way, a few of the people who were some of the players I'm going to talk about are here, so I'll just point them out. Gene McCower was here, one of the lawyers who worked at the, the third of the major Westway trials, which I'll talk about uh, on the opponent's side. And Marcy Benstock, who was probably the identified, and I'll talk about her view as the main lead citizen activist opposing Westway is here. And also I should say that both Jean and Marcy were very helpful in letting me talk to them and understand what put them on and look at documents and try to figure out how this 14-year battle, 14 battle really occurred. Um, when I was a young lawyer starting out in New York in the uh, late 1980s, um, basically what kept on happening is people kept saying, ah, don't forget Westway. Okay, and, it, and the lessons of Westway, um, and maybe because the clientele I was working ranged from the Natural Resource Defense Council, and then also some uh, not-for-profits, and then also corporate clients, also the MTA. Um, every time people said things about Westway, they had very different views about what Westway was about. Um, and so, uh, so I was found it kind of curious, uh, you know, that no one really knew or no one seemed to agree on the basic of Westway's true lessons. So what I'll first do is just tell you first just what the project was. So if some of you, it's new to you, I'll just give you a few pictures, give you a feel for it. So this is a picture of the old elevated West Side Highway, uh, which uh, had some problems, um, and, uh, and it was, uh, and although there's questions about whether uh, some people view this as a stunt, this was a closed highway because it was dangerous, and yet there was a large truck filled with heavy material that was driving up there. Um, and actually, interesting, I've noticed there are several pictures of this scene, and there are different cars in some of the pictures, which I've never quite figured out. But, uh, uh, but in any event, the, um, the West Side Upper, the elevated West Side Highway, or the Miller Highway, clearly was in need of replacement. Um, and, uh, and to give you a sense where this was, that this is where the World Trade Centers were built, and you had the piers, and you had the elevated highway, you can kind of make it, you have to see it right there, moving up the west side. And as I describe this, keep this picture in mind, because what you're seeing here, effectively going out to the end of the piers, going almost a thousand feet out, was what was proposed to become the west side. Okay. So, um, uh, so the old piers were there, they were mostly uh, no longer being used, containerization, See, and the ships had basically moved the shipping industry to New Jersey and other parts of the country that have large flat areas to handle the trucking. So the piers were being lightly used. Um, and here you have the Chelsea piers at the time. Uh, this is from the environmental impact statement. Uh, so they were at that point, they were vacant. They were looking south, those buildings, I'm sure you recognize the World Trade Centers. And this is the West Side Highway, the elevated West Side Highway. Uh, and you can tell even then, just in the land as it was, this is sizable space in a, in a place, Manhattan, where uh, land has always been of great value, even when the city was depressed. Um, and so here's what was proposed. Um, what was proposed was to take uh, federal money, interstate highway money, uh, and uh, get this approved as a segment of the interstate highway network, which would have paid for the replacement highway, 90% to the cost of completion, okay? Basically, the 10% being picked up by the state. This was essentially, by the interstate highway tradition, um, basically a, a blank check 
Although, as you perhaps you can follow the big dig in Boston, when excess gets really goes really quite overboard, there can be oversight and requests and pushes to pull back. But the tradition was 90% to completion. And the proposal was, you're seeing here, here you have where Battery Park City is now, but all of this area going up, all the way up to the south end of Midtown was slated for the West Bay project. Now you'll notice people describe it as a highway development and park project. And if you look at this, you can see the green is essentially a what's we'll called a linear park today. That wasn't the phrase they used. And so the park was along the edge. The white spaces were slated for real estate development. Okay? And, uh, and so important is to see, so it was a big trend, and there also were exchanges coming off of it. As far as the percentages of the project, more of the project, the, the greatest amount of the project was uh, underground highway. Okay, with some of the exchanges. Next was real estate development, and then the third uh, acreage was this kind of linear park that in some sense would have been kind of like a smaller version of what you see at the Riverside Park along the edge. Okay. Um, now, when I say that this was designed to bring in money, there's two highway money, it's important to understand this is not like my view after the fact saying that you know, this was all about money. It was explicitly the goal. Okay. When I interviewed former Mayor Koch, he said this was a major shot in the arm for New York. And this was a brilliant stroke. It would give us money, a cost of completion. New York couldn't afford this, but with federal money, it could be afforded. Uh, and that was the view um, uh, that it was a design. It was a goal to bring in money. Why do people need money at that point? Well, all cities need money. But in 1971, when this got rolling, New York was struggling. Okay? Uh, and some of you perhaps remember the uh, Uncle Sam to New York drop dead, or Ford to New York drop dead. You know, New York at that point, the subways were in terrible condition. There was serious crime problems, um, and New York fiscally was a mess. Um, and, uh, and one thing is clear is everyone in the city documents, I started looking at the documents, everyone knew subways were the lifeblood of the city. But interstate highway money is initially proposed was only available for pilot. Okay? So I'll talk about that change. How much was this going to be worth? Or how much would this cost? The official line quickly settled at about two billion dollars. Okay? Now that today, a billionaire, a billionaire, you know, let's, what's the big deal? A billion dollars then was a lot of money, but actually people internally were saying they thought it would be probably six to ten billion dollars. Um, and actually when I was talking to one of the people, I'll just say one of the few people asked not to be quoted for attribution, but someone who was on the government side of the project. And I said, how much do you think this would cost? And this person said, I actually think it probably would cost the 20 to $30 billion range. He said, when you compare this to the big dig in Boston, it had some complexities. He thought that this would escalate to that level. Uh, that made it the most expensive highway ever proposed on Earth, okay, per inch, per mile, whatever it was. It was a major project. And so, so what would it look like? And here's a couple of other pictures to give you a feel. So here you have, that's not the real world, okay? That's a, that's a model. In case any of you are wondering, the Hudson has never been sliced like that, and it's never been that still. Um, so that is one of the piers coming off, and it would have been, uh, this is what would have replaced it. So you can see again to give you a sense. Um, it would have extended in places almost 1,000 feet into the Hudson. Okay, just to be clear. So this was not just replacing the footprint of the old West Side Highway, this was going out into the river almost a thousand feet. Okay. And so you can see the sunken highway there, and then you see space, I think, I assume that's probably space for development, and then access to the River Edge Park. Okay. Um, so, um, who wanted this project? Um, some powerful people wanted this project, okay? So, um, so here you have, for those who don't know it, so anyone know who that forehead belongs to? No, 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 no the forehead right there. Anyone know? Uh, it's, come on, it's a distinctive forehead. That's Raymond Donovan, the Secretary of Labor. He was a strong supporter. Why? Because both many of the banks and financial interests, law firms, and unions wanted Westwood. Why? It was a huge construction project. Okay? So Raymond Donovan was internally fighting for it. Then you have Mario Cuomo, the governor of New York. Ed Koch, then you have 
That is the real that's not a statue. That is Ronald Reagan. And what he's holding there is an $85 million check uh, and the uh, safe deposit box is even larger. Um, but uh, uh, and that was essentially one of the down payments to get West Way rolling. Uh, next to him is a union or a construction worker named Basil Powell. Someone else pointed out that he didn't look much like a construction worker in the way in the fatigues, but he was in the uh, Reagan library. Basil, Basil Powell, construction worker. You have Alphonse D'Amato. Behind him, you have uh, Patrick and Patrick Moynihan. Okay? And so, and uh, which guy? The guy behind. The back there, that's where I don't know the top of that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hear, I, I moved him out of the way, and I just can't find that out. But, um, I believe it was my great great grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, so these, these were powerful interests. And the only person who's not there who appeared regularly in the news about Westwood was David Rockefeller. David Rockefeller, uh, you know, the Bill Gates, I don't know who we call him this day, but the most probably powerful person with both real estate and banking interests from a powerful family. He was a strong supporter of Westway. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and he also supported. So you have essentially financial interests, law firms, construction interests, unions, political leadership uh, that wanted this, uh, and quite a bit of clout. Okay? And um, so the question then is, well, who could oppose this? And why isn't the thing built today? How could Westway have been defeated? And before I show you the picture of the formidable opposition, um, you should know that one of the lines about Westway, both at the time and as I was doing the research for this book, uh, was that people, actually I gave a talk in Washington about this, and, and a lawyer at EPA said, I remember when I read about this when I was at uh, law school or college, he said, people said this was a classic NIMBY battle. This was just local opposition looking out for themselves. And I said, no, I don't think that's right, and I'll tell you why I don't think that's right. But there is this theme that because of these people, oh, sorry, because of the powerful political interests, that this was kind of a defeat that went against democratic priorities. Okay? However, on the opposition you have, okay, a formidable group. Now, now there are here, here you have Marcy still recognizable right there. Okay? Uh, the other one of the other main activists, Bunny Gable from Friends of the Earth, uh, next to Dan Gable right there, uh, behind him. Um, and then if you look even further right there, that is David Brower, okay, one of the nation's preeminent environmentalists and friends of the earth. Um, and then again, I still don't know, but I think this guy has the best sideburns since <laughs> since Jobs. Okay. Yeah. 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 But um, um, this was a fundraiser on the Clearwater, okay? Uh, and the Clearwater was one of the main opponents of the Westway project. So this is a fundraiser uh, in the Clearwater, for those of you who don't know that history, is the not-for-profit that Pete Seeger was involved in founding, uh, and which was involved in a number of the battles uh, to save the Hudson. Now, um, now, Marcy's here, but I will uh, uh, characterize her here and say what some other people said. So one is, she was the constant leader, okay? Um, but it is also the case that she insists, and it's quite clear when you look at the documents, that it, she was one of what was a growing and quite formidable coalition of opponents that over time gained quite a bit of momentum both locally, um, at the state level, and then even at the federal level. We'll talk about in a minute. Um, she described herself as a, like a jailhouse lawyer and learning to use law on the fly. Um, excuse me? This is Marcy Benstock, okay? That person here, the citizen opponent, the person in front of you to your left, okay? Um, and, um, and so she attended this, they attended leaflets, they attended uh, meetings, protests. Bunny Gable tracked down some documents and said, but by her records, they attended at least 500 uh, various community meetings in opposition to the project over its 14 years of battle. Um, now, um, there is, most people also share credit. Uh, one of the interesting interviews I talked to, John Mylod, who's one of the uh, citizen opponents, and he was working on behalf of the Hudson River Sloop Clearwater. Um, uh, he said, without the law, we couldn't have won. Okay? But then people also said, without the citizen opponents, we couldn't have won. And both statements are true. Okay? 
and we'll see how important they were. But there were two main lawyers, and a third year, I don't have a picture of Gene for the book, but as I said, Gene McCarroll's an opponent. This is Al Butzel. He was the first lead attorney opposing the project. Um, and then later in the case, the lead attorney was Mitchell Bernard. Um, and, uh, and then I'll go back for a second. Al Butzel also um, fought the Storm King project, one of the earlier major battles. He also was someone who fought in favor of the Hudson River project, uh, which had led to a, an ongoing clash about the goals of the Hudson River project, and clashes also, as the book talks about, with his former client. Mitchell Bernard is now the head of litigation for the Natural Resources Defense Council, and he's viewed by many as maybe the preeminent environmental lawyer. Uh, but at that point, he was 16 years old, as you can tell from the picture. Okay. Um, now, um, one interesting thing about this, I'm not going to read a lot of quotes from the book, but one interesting issue that's part of debates about law and environmental law and Westway was the relative roles of different people. And, uh, and especially, like, how much does the law matter, how much does citizen activism matter? And, um, and uh, one statement that I'll just quote that in, in interviewing different people to try to find out what they were doing strategically, Marcy Benstock said the following. Said, those lawyers, perhaps all, all, all lawyers, always think they did everything when in fact they had no interest in finding out or building on what other people were doing, especially people who weren't wealthy or powerful. Okay? And then John Mylod, in actually the same conversation, he said, without the ability to go to court, we would have lost. Okay? And so there is this kind of slightly ambivalent role about the role of lawyers, which is, I think, one of the interesting aspects of the West Coast Battles. Um, uh, Ed Koch, when I interviewed him, I did not have to mention who the key players were. He said, he said, uh, Marcy Benstock, she was the brains of the outfit. They were very smart. To defeat Westway, they had to beat the unions and the banks and the advocates for Westway. Okay? Now, by 1985, it was defeated. So when I go into the project, I wanted to kind of find out what had happened. Okay? As a lawyer, as a young lawyer, I kept hearing different stories about what had happened and why it happened. And, um, and as a law professor, I also, there are several cases I taught from the Westway battles. And even there, looking at the cases themselves, the cases, a decision by a court is like the tip of an iceberg, okay? And people tend to glorify what judges say, but what the law is, is, is the underlying statutes and regulations and traditions and what the lawyers and others make the law do, okay? And so I was kind of interested, so I had kind of two main goals. I wanted, I said, Westway is one of environmental law's epic battles. And people know about it, and I wanted to know, um, with all the criticism of its defeat, like what really happened. But also, environmental law is very much in the crosshairs, uh, in the sense of you know, in the in the sights of people who want to kill environmental law. And just an example, I just testified at a congressional hearing a few weeks ago, and at this hearing, Congressman, where one of them was said the following, he said, the Environmental Protection Agency. I hate the Environmental Protection Agency. They should send it to China. Okay? This is a US congressman in a public hearing. Okay? And they proceeded to say, this is bureaucrats in Washington trying to control land use throughout the country. And so a battle like West Wing matters. Okay? If one of its epic battles really was a miscarriage of justice and defeated democracy and was wrong, then it's an exhibit for the anti-environmental law. If it was, in fact, a battle that was defeated on the merits directly, well, that is also important. And on Westway, what I found going into it was conflict. And then I had another goal, which I won't talk about as much, but despite lots of books about law, books about sports, and books about music, most books about law focus on trials, usually about the toxic torts, like a civil action, right? They, they focus on injuries where people are trying to recover money, and yet, the highest stakes kinds of legal battles are actually usually involving things like air, safety, workplace, discrimination. And there's never, been, there's never been a book that's tried to kind of illuminate how high stakes regulatory battles are fought. And so going into this, I decided to kind of write a book that I hope would work at two levels. One is just tell the story of Westway, but also illuminate how high stakes regulatory battles are fought. So, uh, so there are several stages uh, to the battle, to the battles, and really several claims. And I'm going to kind of distill them and get into the story. So one basic contested story is democracy. Okay, was Westway's defeat 
a victory for democracy or a frustration of democracy. Okay? And the frustration of democracy is probably the, the story you've seen most if you see the periodic references a few times a year. Some article will refer to Westway and people refer to it often as frustration of democracy. So I'll talk about that. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the, the real battles that happened here. So one was um, the, the money designated for Westway was through actions by Massachusetts representatives and Bella Abza, in part because of Westway, the law was changed to allow a trade. I'll talk about that. And then uh, modern environmental laws were passed just as Westway was born. Okay? So right as Westway came of age, essentially in the late 60s or 1971 is probably the most official date, the environmental laws were passed. The National Environmental Policy Act was passed. Immediately afterwards, the Modern Clean Water Act was amended, and you have uh, the Clean Air Act as well. So you have NEPA, the Environmental Impact Statement Law, Clean Water Act, and I'm going to refer to Section 404. Um, that's the law that basically prohibits filling of waters of the United States unless you have to fill the water, and unless you can show there will be no significant harm, and you can show that there's no uncertainty about those harms. Okay? And so there were three main laws, but then I'll talk about this um, highway change. But, um, so here I have these notes. Um, you know, one thing before I kind of get into telling you about the stories, um, before I get into the stories a little more, the basic moving pieces of the Westway battles, okay, which is battles in Congress, battles in agencies, battles in the courts, citizens, public interest lawyers, powerful monetary interests, all of these things remain the constituent elements of battles you read about today. Okay? And so Westway itself is, in some respect, ancient history, but the basic moving parts of this battle remain very much the same moving parts of modern environmental and regulatory battles. And so I'm going to tell you about Westway, but if you wanted to understand the battles over climate change now, you'd find the same things. Do you believe the science? Do you go with your intuitions? Do you go with science? Which interests should hold sway? Uh, the basic uh, elements of the Westway battle uh, remain elements today. So, um, so first, this dollars for highways, this is one of the interesting, I find, the most neglected part of the Westway battle story. Okay? that uh, when people talk about Westway today, they tend to omit uh, completely that there was a very substantial democratically sanctioned choice to be made. Okay? And the choice was, initially, would New York take billions of free dollars? Okay? And New York said, yes, okay, we'll take that. But uh, Massachusetts had about $600 million designated for a highway that was proposed, and they did not want to build it. And so uh, Governor Sargent, working with his representatives, and a guy named Alan Altshuler, who's now a professor at Harvard, um, they started trying to change federal law to allow a trading of designated highway dollars for mass transit. Bella Abzug became part of that action. And through actions about four different amendments to the law, by the mid-1970s, the law had been changed so that Westway dollars could be traded they could be traded for mass transit, a modest replacement road, and the value of the trading, although capped at a set level, uh, would be set at the higher of uh, basically inflation-adjusted amounts. Okay? So notice there's two differences. Notice the difference there, right? I said Westway as a highway was built cost of completion, okay, 90%. The interstate highway trade-in was capped, but the capped amount was at the end of the day several billion dollars. Okay? And as soon as that amendment went through, John Zuccotti, who was the deputy mayor, said to Peter Kiernan, who was working with Bella Abzo in Washington, uh, Zuccotti said, we just killed Westway. And he said, because people knew within the, and you can see it in the Koch archives, once you had this trading, and it could be traded for subways, which far more people depended on. You had two legitimate choices. And in fact, it did change the entire sort of democratic nature of the battle. After the trade-in uh, was authorized, 
when there were polls taken, I've never, I could not find any record of any poll ever showing people favoring Westway with a trade-in on the ledger or on, on the scale. Okay? Um, and so, uh, and that remained a constant. However, the trade-in has to be agreed to by the mayor and the governor. Okay? And the mayors and the governors in New York wanted Westway and they fought for it. And, uh, and so the opponents were forever advocating the trade-in, but the trade-in, and the trade-in was a legitimate option, but it had to be basically endorsed by New York's leaders. And so I will talk about the end game soon. So um, then the next issue was air, right? Which is, okay, you're building this huge highway, uh, a larger highway than was there. Uh, would this cause air problems? And uh, what happened was people looked at the actual data and the environmental impact statement and technical documents and found that the air modeling was defective in a number of respects. Um, part of it involved how many parking spaces were in this area that would draw people in, in their cars from the suburbs in New Jersey and the rest, um, and essentially attract traffic rather than dissipate traffic. Uh, and they found that the numbers were wrong. Okay? And then when people started doing the air modeling, they found that actually at the, I'll go back to show you some of the exchanges, you know, if you look at some of these exchanges where the road came out, there's more up in there, uh, they found that at the egresses that it would cause carbon monoxide violations of federal standards. Okay? And that basically is not allowed. And so uh, one of the things I talked about in that book, which is spectacularly interesting, I should say, but, the, uh, but in the battles, um, there was a strong push to get Westway going, okay? And uh, Governor Kerry called up his lawyer, but that comes Fritz Schwartz, who's a Corvass for and more, and, um, and he tried to push, I mean, and later on this court counsel had, had lawyer for New York City, and later on the head trustee for the Natural Resources Defense Council. But Kerry said, you know, Fritz, I want you to push this project through, you know, jam this through, and what Schwartz said was no. He said, the numbers are wrong, that's short-sighted, you're going you're to get defeated. And he said, we have to go back. And Schwartz prevailed, and the city and the state let the engineers go back and fix the problem. Basically, what became known as the briar pack solution. They basically prevented people from being able to stand around the egress points with bushes. Okay, that was the plan. And by keeping people away from the carbon monoxide, there would not be violations. Okay? And, uh, and although that might seem, surely that wouldn't be enough, but when Al Lutzel and other people looked at this, it was correct. Okay? And there was not essentially that vulnerability. So the air battle came to an end, but several years had gone by. But, um, and uh, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the aspects of law that people tend not to know about, including my law students, I say to my law students, here's a big issue. What are you going to do if the government is going to come after your client? And they go, file a brief, and I go like, can you think of anything else? And one of the things people don't understand is that law is, that the regulatory process is not like a court trial. People talk all the time. Regulators talk to citizens, they talk to the government officials, and so one of the things I found in researching this was that the senators were visiting the decision makers personally, now, if you're a regulatory decision maker, you don't often get a visit by a United States Senator. But they were just dropping by, okay, just to talk and, uh, and perhaps express their concerns. And one of the things that happened was Chuck Warren, uh, who later worked with Gene Carroll, he was the regional administrator for the Environmental Protection Agency. And he, and then there's also a uh, citizen activist named Peter Fletcher, um, several people in John Mylod said, you know, the river is a big issue. But the Modern Clean Water Act had just been amended. But Chuck Warren said to Al Buxley, he said, you know, this air issue, I think in the end you can't win. He said, but the Section 404, the dredge and fill permit, I think you're going to find that there is more there. Okay? And now, I'm going to just tell you, this, this was a long part of the, of, this, of the book and tells what happened. This actually involved two rounds of environmental impact statements two political end runs, one of which succeeded, one of which failed, um, going to Washington, three trials, two appellate rulings, and a major vote in Congress. Okay? And so this end game uh, 
was no short end game, but a long, drawn out, and quite interesting uh, battle. Now, um, the environmental impact statement for Westway as it says here, floating debris is common along the west side waterfront in the basins between the remaining piers. And the text talked about oil and pollution and periodic boils that would rise to the surface due to the toxic and sludgy material underneath. Okay? Um, and, uh, and the environmental impact statement and uh, some technical documents describe the site as, in very important language, biologically impoverished, okay, or a biological wasteland. Okay? The problem, however, is that the underlying technical documents show that that in the areas between the piers and in the pilings where they were on the surface, there were a lot of fish, okay? And in fact, a substantial number of young striped bass, okay? And so this story, you know, so, so the environmental impact statement again, floating debris, biological wasteland, but the technical documents and the data indicated that this was inaccurate. And, um, and so um, people fought over this. One of the interesting elements reasons I decided to take on this project, there was a congressional investigation of the project. Uh, Congress can get documents that normal people cannot. Okay? So if, if Gene McCarroll lawyer said, show us your documents, you only get documents that are non-deliberative. Congress says, show us your documents. They have to turn everything over. And there was a massive compendium of Western-related documents that revealed what happened here. The documents said it was a wasteland internally Scientists and staff and regulators uh, were saying this is wrong. Okay, this is wrong, and quite within the Army Corps of Engineers that had to grant the floor of Section 404 permit, uh, internal people were saying this is wrong. This is not a dead zone, and the claim has no scientific basis. Um, uh, nevertheless, the Army Corps of Engineers, after skirmishing, granted the key permit to allow the project to be built, and. Uh, the New York Times, which supported the project, and others said, end of story. But it's not the end of the story, because Marcy Benstock and the Clean Air Project, the uh, New York City Clean Air Project that she headed, and other environmental groups under our law can go to court. Okay? And they did. Uh, and they went to court, and they ended up, after one hearing before another judge, they ended up before Judge Thomas Guise. Okay? Judge Guise is a uh, there's nothing in his background that I'd expect it. Maybe think he was an ardent environmentalist. He was a partner of Davis Polk and Wardwell, a prominent corporate firm. He was on the bench due to the sponsorship of Republicans. Okay? But he also, as it turned out, uh, was very much a kind of rule of law judge. And uh, became pretty clear in the hearing, took offense, probably at kind of a personal level, if people were not playing straight with him if they were being advocates to an excessive extent. Um, now, I should say that uh, when I mentioned earlier the, the Chuck Warren saying to Al Butzel about, you know, look at Section 404, look at the Clean Water Act, one of the key documents that ended up before Judge Rizé was, I'll show it to you, it's nothing exciting, but this document is about a 20-some-odd page document drafted by scientists and staff at the National Marine Fisheries Service in late 1980. Okay? If there's any document which probably killed the project, it is this document. Why? Because in this case, the scientists and staff um, looked at the data, they monetized the value of the striped bass industry, they pointed out that there was federal legislation trying to protect striped bass, because they were plummeting the population along the eastern seaboard. Um, and they looked at the actual data. And basically, it was, you know, they were neutrals in the battle. They were regulators and scientists. But that document ended up being almost a roadmap for the arguments that were developed for Judge Rizé and in the trial over the Section 404. Now, um, and I say this in part because one of the common stories I'm sure you hear is anti-bureaucrats, right? We want to send EPA to China. Um, and in this case, if you look, the regulators and their staff and the scientists uh, actually were very brave. Uh, one of the documents, uh, a regulator, there was notes kept of a meeting of multiple agencies, and they said, the pressure is crushing, okay? Because there was so much pressure from top down to 
to approve West Point. Now, um, so in any event, uh, so there you have Brise, and um, one person said of him, he's, he's known among lawyers for, in addition to being kind of very much a rule of law judge, he also is famous for being very active in questioning witnesses himself. Okay? And one of the lawyers of the United States, who was defending the project, said there were echoes of Torquemada in the Spanish Inquisitor. <laughs> okay? And, uh, and uh, uh, nevertheless, um, so there was a trial before him, and I'm going to just, this is a high tech document, vintage, early 1980s. Okay? And so this would be a PowerPoint that would be glossy and would be glowing today. But this, remember, it's a biological wasteland. Okay? Well, West, these two, these are the two main areas of sampling, and these are striped bass, and all of these other areas, if you look, are pretty much the entire other New York estuary or New York bike, it's called different things. The New York Harbor, and a little bit out to Long Island Sound, and a little bit on the outskirts into the ocean. The place that young striped bass were found, and every time people sampled, they kept finding them in higher and higher numbers, was right where Westway was proposed to be. One and two, basically zero to two-year-old striped bass, for some reason, liked to be, uh, or were found here more than anywhere else. And people kept saying, oh, they're elsewhere. Okay? They just didn't find them elsewhere. They found, uh, one later sampling found some over on the New Jersey side, comparable habitat. And in one set of data, they found a cluster of population in one sampling data set up near Yonkers. Um, but the one area that was consistently in high numbers was right where West Bay was supposed to be. Now, remember I told you section 404 says you can't build in water unless you need it to be there. Okay? So the argument here was we need to build a highway in the water uh, for the park and redevelopment. And in the end, that argument mostly carried the day. But you're not allowed to build in the water if it will cause significant degradation of significant aquatic habitat. And you also can't build if there's uncertainty about whether there will be significant harm. And so the data kept showing this. And at the end of the first trial, uh, this, this was prepared and uh, presented by a scientist named Ian Fletcher. And uh, looking at the records of the trial, that was basically it. I mean, to be honest, once you have the regulatory documents, the NIMS documents, and you had the actual numbers, there was no honest disclosure. It was not accurate. There were clearly threats to the striped bass, and the project, the uh, permit that was granted was vetoed. Defeat. Now, that wasn't defeat. That was the first, okay? So then there's a political remand. Uh, for those of you who kind of want to see how sausage is made regulatory style, I have a chapter between 1982 and 84, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers and the planners had an opportunity to go back and get it right. And so, uh, and this one nice is because of the litigation and documents disclosed, I was able to, and talking to people and people sharing documents, you can kind of see what went on during this process. Um, but basically, to give you a couple uh, of the highlights, so one possibility was uh, after this, there was a push uh, uh, to uh, have a, an appropriations rider passed in Congress that was for the protection of striped bats. And I personally was really thinking I read that. Now, the only problem was what it actually was slated to do was to allow the building of West Bay, where the piers were, um, and it had nothing to do with striped bats. It didn't even mention West Bay. It described projects approved on a certain date that had certain characteristics, so it was only applicable to West Bay. Um, and the idea was this would be attached to a large appropriation rider. Governor Cuomo was claimed to be behind it, and the law firm that, he did, that was working for him uh, was described as, uh, the K. Shoulder firm, uh, was described as having drafted it. But it, but it came out. And so uh, Marcy Benstock and other opponents ran to Washington. Environmental groups got involved. The, the major national, national environmental groups were not big players in the West Bay, apart from Friends of Earth. But when this appropriation rider was proposed to gut Section 404 for West Bay, then they all signed letters and they fanned out met with representatives, and ultimately the Reagan administration refused to sign. Okay. 
Uh, there was another thing that happened. The uh, Army Corps of Engineers said, we need two winters to study spread backs. Um, and, uh, and this too, there was a political end run. And Governor Cuomo wrote directly to the head of the Army Corps and said, uh, shorten this to one winter. Okay? This will kill the project, shorten this to one winter. And on that end run, they succeeded. So in the end, there was one winter of new study allowed because of essentially a bypass of the usual Army Corps of Engineers uh, appeals process. Um, now, you would think, so again, you have pretty powerful interests supporting the project. You saw Reagan, you saw the rest. Um, and you also have science. And so now you've had a lot more data collected. It was one of the most intensive sampling of any river to figure out the nature of the habitat. And the new sampling kept finding striped bass. Again, in some more areas, again, as I said, sometimes over by New Jersey, but to put it all together, the heaviest use was right where Westway was proposed to be. Okay? Um, you know, I, I've always wondered why my view, people have different theories. It was a staging area, it was a sheltering area. My theory is it was the music. Okay? It was a very good time for music in the downtown area. And so, again, many of you lived here perhaps. I think that probably makes sense. Um, but, um, Although CBGB's is pretty far east, of here, I don't think that they would have heard. But uh, at any event, um, but the new data confirmed what the earlier data, the earlier data showed, and a draft environmental impact statement came out and said this project uh, basically said will cause significant harm. It said this is heavily used habitat. Uh, you cannot call this was a potentially vital winter refuge. Um, they did not say anything about a uh, biological waste in line. They quoted a fishery expert named William Doble, who said that this was a staging area that might provide a last shelter, a jumping off spot for the young striped bass. Um, and, uh, and so people seeing the draft thought, Westway is destined for defeat, okay? Because the draft, basically, if you took its language and read it in an ordinary way, it said significant risks. The statute says you cannot build in water that will cause significant degradation of water habitat. However, uh, shortly thereafter, uh, the final environmental impact state, actually, I should say before we get to this, late in the game, uh, the consultants working for the state and the Army Corps uh, were running numbers because it's hard to figure out you have to sample things similarly, like how important is an area. And the consultants working for the government found that 44% of one of the classes of young striped bass was present in the piers. Now, 44%. Now, I, um, I, I, I used to have a slide but I cut it out. But, the New, York have, the New York estuary is huge, okay? This was, you know, this may be 0.001% or maybe less of the Hudson River estuary. And what they were saying was 44% of one of these classes of striped bass was found right where uh, Westway was slated to be built. And a guy named Dennis Soskowski, uh, who was working for the Army Corps at the time, he said, if this didn't require denial of the permit, I didn't know what would, okay? However, um, the final environmental impact statement came out and its conclusions were reversed. Okay? It no longer said there were significant harms, it said there were not significant harms. Uh, and basically, as you move through the document, it, uh, it just eliminated all of the language of significant harm and precipitous decline and the, left and the rest. Um, interestingly, or maybe a warning sign, there was yet another theory why this was, and it was a theory that the striped bass would simply migrate. They would just move. And language on that was attributed to William Dover, who was the same scientist who earlier had talked about the staging. Um, and so um, this finally came out. The decision maker, Fletcher Griffiths, was the decision maker for the Army Corps of Engineers. He went back and forth, he granted the permit, and back to court went Gene McCarroll and uh, back for Judge Bizet. At this point, uh, Mitchell Bernard took over. Um, and, uh, and so there was yet another trial. There actually was another trial I left out in there where in one of the more bizarre things, the uh, Federal Highway Administration asked for a trial uh, at an earlier point. Normally agencies don't want trials, but they wanted a trial and the baby was only 
worse. But in any case, this is the third trial. Mitchell Bernard was a young lawyer working with Gene McCarroll. They were at the firm uh, Buxel and Cass. I forget what it was. It was a, uh, an offshoot firm um, that was working just on this. Um, the story quite quickly became that the earlier draft was using the word significant just to mean statistical. Okay? It wasn't saying major. It was saying the harms were just discernible, which is what significant could mean. The problem was there were lots of other documents, and one of the pleasures of doing this, this research was I found a brief that Gene McCarroll and Bernard wrote where they went through the entire environmental impact statement, all of the language that talked about the significant harms in the draft, and then compared the changes to the final. And it was quite a devastating document. Um, you know, one little side story, since you're all here, you're New Yorkers. Um, you all probably remember Sidney Schamberg, right? Yes. Sidney Schamberg, who wrote the Village Voice. At the time of these battles, he had an op-ed column in the New York Times. And there was one of the battles where the New York Times was ardently in favor of Westway and kept writing editorials about it. His news reporters wrote some very good reporting, but often would go patches with no stories. Um, and uh, several of the New York Times editorial writers, op-ed writers, uh, Anthony Lewis wrote a piece against Westway, um, John Oakes wrote several pieces against Westway, and Sidney Schamberg started to follow it very closely, and the trial really was looking at documents and understanding what was going on. He finally wrote a very uh, strong piece likening the Westway scandal to the stink in a closed kitchen of a New Orleans celebrity chef in New York. And, it, and the language had said something like, if you think the stink is bad in the kitchen that was just shut down with the chef, you should go down to the courthouse and understand what's been going on with Westbrook. And, uh, and one of the things he found, um, and that came out of the trial, was a document from a very high up person in the White House on environmental policy that said the following. EPA, which at this point was opposing the project, um, was writing a letter in opposition. And in this document that came out, the document said, uh, Daggett, who was the regional administrator, hasn't gotten the message. Nothing will kill Westway faster than a common letter like this from EPA. And Sidney Chamber cited to that as well his column. And the New York Times took away his column. And, uh, and and I spoke to Sidney Chamber, and he yeah, he said no one's ever said it was taken away because of this column, but other journalists did say that there were national stories saying you know a voice of conscience and that uh, for the right of the little guy has been silenced, and they attributed to this increasingly stark clash between the Times editorial board and op-ed writers. And so for those of you who are moving about Sidney Chamber, he's the Killing Fields reporter also. And so, um, so what happened? Um, the trial went on and on, and pretty quickly the, uh, the project was again on the ropes, and the United States decided to present William Doval as a witness. Okay? And I'm going to wrap up in a minute, but uh, the, one of the, I think, interesting and exciting stories here is um, William Doval was not a government scientist. He didn't have a PhD. Um, and in the end, this multi-billion dollar project basically rested on him. He was described as the author of the definitive report about striped bass in the Hudson. Um, and, uh, and he was, in fact, one of only two witnesses at the trial who was not a regulatory decision. Um, and he got on the stand and he basically said, I have figured out this river, I've figured out, I've developed a model, there is no risk. And then Mitchell Bernard got, uh, got him on the stand and he had him on the stand for over three days, and it's really one of the most devastating cross-examinations you will ever need or witness. He took this witness apart, and he, you knew things were bad when the witness started saying words to the following. Well, the following is what he said. When I wrote that, I did not mean it. <laughs> and so, and this was not, and, and the first time he said that, Judge Musay said, can you pause for a second? Can you read that back? <laughs> <laughs> and and, and, and uh, Mr. Bernard said, well, I'd like to move on. He goes, no, I, and then Judge said, did you mean what you just said? Okay, and when he wrote it, and he said, yes, I have new data, but I was writing, and, 
and I didn't agree with it at the time, and he kept saying it. And it happened, and it became, and so it got to the point where Mitch would be saying, and did you agree with this when you wrote it? And, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and the reason he did this was this supposedly definitive report in its actual writing mostly supported, or in substantial part, supported the opponents of Westway. And yet he was claiming it supported the building of Westway. And then he started saying, like, well, this is true about striped bass and rivers, but not true for the Hudson River and the striped bass. Okay? And so at the end of those days, um, uh, and it's, it really is, was quite a brilliant cross-examination, um, it was blister. I mean, it was awful. And, uh, and shortly after that, the government tried to present one other witness who would essentially save the project. And, but he wasn't involved enough to do so. Judge was able to blistering opinion. Uh, then it went up to the Second Circuit, and everyone ran to Congress. Okay, and so one of the interesting parts of this is again when people talk about Westway, a lot of the actors of it was just Judge Rizé and one lady. Okay, and that is kind of the story you hear. Um, and uh, but in fact. The opponents and the supporters went to Washington. The supporters wanted to get an extension to try to salvage Westway. The opponents wanted to kill Westway. Um, and Congress, of course, can trump anything. Right? Congress can pass a law that allowed Westway. Um, so people were fighting in Washington. The lawyers were briefing for the Second Circuit. And on September 11, 1985, another September 11 in New York history, the Second Circuit affirmed Judge Jose on the water issue, saying the permit was uh, incorrectly granted. Um, he said, uh, the Second Circuit said, they could do it, they had a do-over, they could try again. Judge Jose had said the project was dead. The Second Circuit said they could try to do it again if they wanted to. But literally, at the moment the Second Circuit's ruling came out, Congress was debating Westway on the floor of Congress, actual people speaking, which often doesn't happen. Um, and that very day, so the people on the floor were trying to read the Second Circuit opinion. And later that afternoon, they voted. They voted two to one to cut off funding for Westway. Okay? So Congress voted two to one to turn on Westway. The Second Circuit uh, rejected Westway. And a few weeks later, New York surrendered. And the Army Corps surrendered. And they traded in Westway for mass transit, a replacement road, bike paths, and the like. Now, um, you know, I've showed you pictures of the lawyers, but understand, you think about all this, why did people go to court? Only because the citizen opponents could go to court. Why did they have power? Because the law gave them the power, okay? Um, the lawyers were able to do the work, but the vote in Congress could have gone the other way. Um, and so, you know, just a couple of things I'd say, you know, assessing the defeat, um, you know, was Westway needed? This is something that some people said, you know, was what would Westway have been a good thing? Yet I, I'm not sure. This book is more about the fight uh, over Westway. You know, if Westway could have been dropped with no disturbance, some people I've heard, including people who were parts of the opposition, said it might have been an okay thing to have. But a lot of other people said a thousand feet into the Hudson, okay, and plus all that real estate development that was never described. Uh, they think this would have been a disaster. But the claim was New York needed this to get its real estate in gear. Donald Trump actually said, late in the Westway, said, as soon as you get rid of the overhang of Westway, New York's west side is going to go crazy with the dollar. And that's what happened, right? And then you had Hudson River Park built as well. Um, so was Westway needed? In retrospect, look at what happened. The answer is not for the development goals uh, and not for a park either. Now, the anti-democratic claims are the most prevalent thing I found. And I would say this, that one is, I think, you did have political leadership who wanted it. You had governors and mayors and senators who wanted it. But if you look at the votes of legislative bodies at city, state, and federal level, votes were prevailed against Westway, not in favor. Polls also showed that Westway had more citizens opposed to it once they had the trade in. And very importantly is the law takes sides. I mean, just, you know, people want to lie to me. Congress may be foolish, right? But when Congress passes a law, it chooses the priorities for the nation. And when Congress passed NEPA, the Environmental Impact Statement Law, the Clean Water Act, and the Clean Air Act, 
they decided essentially how much weight to give health and air and water protection. And there's no doubt without the Clean Water Act, the West Bay would have been built. Okay? And so the Democratic, anti-democratic claims, uh, I don't think they're the case. Wasn't, another thing you'll hear people say, was it a procedural snafu? Uh, people said, uh, Randy Mastro, uh, a famous lawyer now, who's uh, been working on the Chevron battles in Ecuador for the oil companies and did the report about Governor Christie and the GW George Washington Bridge and viewed by many as one of the nation's top litigators. Um, when I interviewed him, he said, you know, this was a, this was a battle killed because of a procedural error, okay? A procedural error that set back uh, New York 20 years. However, very importantly, the law, the NEPA law, the Environmental Impact Statement law is purely procedural. It just requires honest disclosure. Okay? The Clean Water Act and its regulations, however, were undoubtedly substantive. It is described by environmental lawyers as a roadblock statute. Okay? And that is because it is, it says you cannot fit, you cannot pollute without a permit, you cannot fill unless you have to, and you can't fill if you're going to cause significant aquatic harm. And so it was not about a procedural snafu. It was about Section 404 of the Clean Water Act, and the risks were disclosed because of NEPA. Uh, but very importantly, uh, it wasn't about one witness or one judge. It was two rounds of the Court of Appeals. Uh, it was three trials. It was Congress. And in the end, this was not a procedural snafu. Very important. The law protects, uh, you know, sets priorities. But notice here, the law's goals would have been lost because in the end, the political actors folded their cards rather than fight the party. Okay? The Army Corps kept saying yes. Okay? EPA did not fight up to the White House level. And some of the other groups did not you know, go to court as sometimes they will. But citizens and their lawyers in the United States can take on uh, very powerful people and show the legality of what occurs. I was talking to some Chinese lawyers a few years ago and a Chinese lawyer, uh, after, he said, in China, the law is like a beautiful picture. He looked at it, including his colleagues. Said, what do you mean? He goes, you can look at it, but you cannot take it down and use it. Okay? And in the United States, you can take the law down, and you can use it. It's operational. Uh, and were the states, they, yes, they were. So um, that's now. And here, there's a sign there. Uh, there you have looking south, and you still see the piers. They are, uh, as far as the denouement of this, you know, the, um, uh, you know, the battle over what should be done with the Hudson and Hudson River Park, you know, that continues to be a source of tension. Many of you live in the village. I assume you're aware of this. Uh, and it is the case that you look across the country, battles to build in America's waters, it's a perennial goal. Okay? Um, and so uh, when I testified at this recent congressional hearing, Someone from the National Association of Home Builders said that if waters of the United States were protected, he would go out of business. Okay. Now, I, I said to him, I thought that was a whopper. And, I, and, I, and I, afterwards, and he said, maybe I'll retire. Um, but but uh, it was like, yeah, she said that after the hearing. But, the, uh, but so the battles to fight, you know, these things don't come cheap. Okay. And so it was a 14 year battle. Um, Mitchell Bernard, I interviewed him, said he viewed this as one of the great victories for the rule of law. Okay? And Buddy Gable uh, <coughs> talked about how thrilling it was to be part of this project of democracy in action in the United States. Uh, and uh, so I think it's a pretty interesting story. I'd be glad to take questions. Um, but the book obviously tells you a lot more. This is skimming the surface, but uh, that's what it's about. So, uh, yeah, we're, um, with the threats of this now in this world, with apathy in the community and things like that, with uh, corporations having the power of the police and things like that, to try to stop protests and things like that, how do you think that you can fight any future development in the and keep it from development? Um, well, I'd say first, Despite this, the Supreme Court has taken three major cases on the Clean Water Act. Congress has tried to weaken the Clean Water Act. The proposals now to take away the Clean Water Act remains strong. Okay? Now, whether a habitat is significant 
is something that depends on time and, and, and the use. But basically, the Clean Water Act has a very strong anti fluoride presumption. If you can't show that something has to be in the water, it cannot be built in the water. And that's why it's a premium source of tension, because you know, if you could build a new acreage, whether it's the Florida coast or the New England coast or the Hudson River, you can create very valuable real estate. And so it is a kind of eternal battle to protect the waters. Um, and then also, you know, the America's fisheries have plummeted. Um, the striped bass, interesting, is one of the very few fisheries that has rebounded since the 1970s. Um, and, and Westway made people protect this estuary. People protected the Chesapeake. Congress passed special laws to protect the striped bass. And so the striped bass are still specially protected. Um, but I'd say, you know, generally, strategically, you know, you have to have people who are extremely smart. Okay? And I say one of the interesting quotes was about Marcy Benstock, I think it was uh, John Oates in the New York Times, said, I've never met someone who was a better supplier of information uh, than Marcy Benstock. And because accurate information is really the point of the record. So you have to be strategic, you have to be persistent, you have to know what to do. And so it's all those things. But honestly, don't fail to pay attention to Congress. They may seem foolish at times, but when they make the choice about what's protected and what isn't, that's the rules of the game. So actually, go back And when, um, when Westwood was defeated, did that money go to Mass Transit? Yes, it did. Actually, How much was it? Um, you know, the, I, I don't, I'd have to look at here, but it basically the initial way it was structured was the trade-in of, basically, no, it was, the, the confusion was this, that there was money already designated for certain things, and so in the end, the actual agreement made it look like it was, I think, 60% for mass transit, but there was then to be an accounting swap where money from one coffer would go to the rest. And actually, when I looked at the data after the fact, it appeared more money went to mass transit than had originally been anticipated, and the replacement surface road cost less than anticipated. Which in the history of New York may be two you know, things that don't happen much. But but so it went so it went to surface road and mass transit. Um, but not as you know, some people wanted more to go to mass transit. And you should know that while my book kind of ends more or less shortly after 1985, um, that that's a whole other round of battles. Like that is making sure that money went to mass transit required again citizen diligence and pressure to make sure it wasn't shifted into other coffers. Uh, you are looking at your pictures. Uh, part of Westway would have been underground and part of it would have been above ground. And then there would be a whole flank of buildings that have been blocked in Jersey so you couldn't see it. Um, you have, is it um, what you're referring to is this, all right, there, yes. Those white. The answer is that's a good question. One of the interesting things was in the Westway battles, this was slated for what for real estate development. It wasn't clear who was going to control it. Late in the battle, uh, to get Mayor Koch's support, Governor Kerry said New York City would control the disposition of that land. Okay? However, there was never a declaration of exactly what it would be, the size of it, who would control it, the uses. There was one little leaflet that showed low dock, low buildings, but that was nowhere a commitment. And one of the people who was involved in planning Westway conceded and goes, yeah, we, we did not ever want to say, you know, we were not going to commit to what it would be, because clearly that would have, you know, if all of a sudden the village knew that there was going to be a whole slew of skyscrapers there, that would have harmed the opposition. So there was never clarity about what it would be. It was just designated to be real estate development. Yeah, that was all the way there. But I don't know if was able to fill from the World Trade Center. So, they were building the plant for that side. Yeah, the reason why that could be built with the fill was that happened before the modern Clean Water Act amendments, plus there was a special legal change to allow that, both in the federal and state level. Yeah. Um, I don't recall uh, the Clean Water Act Yeah. 
yes, no vote. It was five alternatives, but never the alternative of no. So it was. I think you could be right. I have to go back and look and see. But but actually, there there was a there were so many internal battles. One battle was who controlled the stores. Did the board of estimate to that point? Subsequently declared unconstitutional, but at that point, essentially the governing body of the head of the boroughs and several representatives, um, they opposed Westway. But there was litigation, and ultimately, the court said the decision whether to proceed with Westway was the mayor's, not the board of estimates. Uh, but there were also then the community boards. Justice Elena Kagan's uh, father was the head of one of the uh, combo, and he opposed uh, the project. So. Uh, but yeah, so there were, most of votes came out against it, and a lot of times it was never put up in a star code. Even the key documents in the end, assessed in court, never really cleanly said, Westway, trade it. Like, they, they, they skirted that, which was a whole other grounds for some of the battles. Bill, excuse me, just take one more question, because I want you to be able to sign books. I know we're going to have a Yeah, the back, go ahead. Uh, just, just a quick question, sorry. Uh, the current West Street, is that directly into the um, I think that basically, yeah, that's that's what you're seeing there is West Street. That that's this you can't tell there, but that was elevated then. When they took it down, and it fell down too. Uh, when they took it down and fell down, that's what was put in this place. Okay, now that's where we're part. Some and some of these mirrors are collapsed. This is a picture from 19, I think 51, I believe, from the city, is even the city of New York, which has wonderful archives of being there. But um, in any event, uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I hope you find the book interesting. And